Hello, YouTube, uh, fellow uh, Truth Seekers, this is Barbara G. Um, this is a really strange thing. I mean, I just finished watching the movie that I was telling you about in my last video. It wasn't called A Time for Miracles. It was called A Gift of Miracles. Oh, my goodness. I have to tell you, this is really, it was, it's one of these things you know you're led by God to do something and all of a sudden you don't know why and then all of a sudden it makes sense. Um, it's <laughs> So in my last video I was telling you how this incredible experience I had where I felt, I felt like I was exploding but I was at total peace, okay? Total peace. <laughs> While I was exploding. Um, <laughs> so I, after I, I made the video I went back and said, I'm going to watch this video. Now, what's the really odd thing about this is that normally I don't record these kind of, kind of movies. Now, what happened was my sisters yesterday, was it yes, just yesterday? I think it was yesterday. No, no, it was the day before, Wednesday. So on Wednesday, my sisters came downstairs and we were sharing the gift of gab and having a cup of tea and we're just talking. And in the background, one of these movies was playing on the television. And we were all giggling about it and having a little fun about this these these silly romantic movies. You know, they're they're fun. I can say they're romantic, and they're fun. And we but we were giggling about it how they all end the same and they were all the same scenario exactly like a Harlequin romance, exactly the same formula over and over and over and over and over and over again. Once you read one, you've read them all. So anyway, we were all giggling giggling about it. So. <clears throat> Anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. And interestingly enough, my one of my last videos was called Isn't It Romantic? And so I thought to myself, uh, this this is not a coincidence that this is all happening. So anyway, I was I was going through, like I, like I said, I like to record pro, pro, uh, chat, um, shows that I like to watch so I don't have to sit through the commercials, which are usually horrible, absolutely disgusting, or you can fast forward to things that you don't want to see. So anyway, as I was going through the channels, I saw this this movie on the, you know, the basically the Hallmark channel, and where they have the same kind of scenario, same programmed romance movies on all the time. And this one caught my eye, and for some reason I recorded it. Normally I don't record these movies. I was I can sit through and watch it, and, or you know, change the channel once I've got a little tired of it of the same scenario over and over again, but this time I decided, you know what, I think I want to record that. Now, yeah, I thought maybe it was just a coincidence. You know, to me, it's just like, you no, know, it's something I record. I record things all the time. But this wasn't a coincidence. It's another one of those funny things that you think isn't, um, I don't know, just a happenstance. And it wasn't. So I started to watch after I made my last video, which is called, what did I call it now? Uh, New Jerusalem, I think. Uh, City of Peace. Anyway. As I, I was, I said, uh, after I made the video, I sat down and I said, you know what? I fell asleep during the first 15 minutes of this movie. I'm going to finish watching. I'm going to go back and watch this movie again. So I sat down after I made my video and I started watching this movie. And oh my goodness, I'm so glad I did. What a wonderful movie. It had actually moved me to tears. I was crying through most of the movie. Not most of it, but you know, halfway through the movie, I started tearing up. And it's going to be a bit of a spoiler alert. I'm not going to tell you the whole the whole shebang. You might want to go back and go and watch it yourself. A really cute film. It had Rita Moreno. Rita, Rita Moreno, I think that's her name, who died, I think, just a couple of years ago or a year or so ago. Um, the uh, Latin dancer, the dancer from um, um, the Broadway musical by uh, Leonard Bernstein, uh, West Side Story. Um, anyway. She was in it, and she plays a, a interesting role in this movie. Um, but anyway, it, uh, it's it's story uh, it's different from the regular scenario, or the regular Harlequin Hallmark type of movie. And that it's a love story, and it's very romantic. But it's a romance in a different sort of way because this woman who's looking for something more from her life, she wants to be, she she's looking for her doctorate. Okay, she's she's wanting to improve herself. But she needs help, and she and she's told to get the help of this young man, who ends up being, of course, the the love interest in her life, who 
helps her to find basically her emotional side because she's very cut and dry like her father and she didn't have her mother with her. Um, her mother died when she was yet, yet a young child and so she never got to know her mother growing up but she always wanted to know her mother. Now this the story of the starts out with this young man trying to help her write her doctorate okay and um, um, he, he tries to help her with her doctorate to get so she's she's looking for something more in her life <clears throat> but she needs help to, to get to that next del to the next level and um, uh, so she um, in the meantime she finds this she thinks it's just a happenstance she finds this old diary of her mother's who had died years years and years before um, and she finds these these list of gifts that her mother wanted to give to certain people that she didn't know and so this woman with the help of this man searched for these people who her mother wanted to give these gifts to anyway it was such a lovely film and the way it worked out was just lovely and there's a key <laughs> It was a key that this woman wears around her neck that belonged to her mother. Um, and anyway, it, it opens the door to the the home of the man she loves, and she didn't even know it. That's a spoiler alert. She she finds a key that belonged to her mother that belongs to the home of the man she loves. So it's it's a it's really, really, really cute film. But not only that, it was so coincidental that it's a woman who is being led after her mother's dead death by her mother to to find the next or to find to get into the next phase of her life she's being led by this feminine spirit to to move into the next uh area or the next area of her life which includes love but it also includes you know that fact that she's now got a new job and she's in, she's a doctor and she's finding a new phase in her life that that she's needing to or wanting to go into isn't that an interesting coincidence? Interesting. So I just want to read this because um, this is what came to my mind as I was watching this film. It just the 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 spirit, the the, the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us um, into the next realm, um, the era of man and kingdom building and empire building is coming to an end. When you look at Nebuchadnezzar, it's about man's kingdom building, men's trying to to build a kingdom for themselves and be you know ha have this power and glory that it's all coming to a, a crumbling halt when this rock that's that comes from heaven that's not cut by man's hand is comes and hits the foot of the the statue that's made of clay and iron um, you know hardened clay which is swamp 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 water basically you know I was watching the Ten Commandments my sister and I the April. Uh, last week, when when all what after just after the election, my sister was really upset. She said, "I need to watch something," so we decided to watch the Ten Commandments again. And so, anyway, of course, Moses ends up um, walking, and you know, she's tromping in the in the mud to make bricks, to make bricks. And what came to my mind was swamp, the swamp, miry clay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read this passage again. How the woman is being set free um, by the one who had the brass feet and was able to stomp on the head of that snake on our behalf in order to set us free from the bondage that Satan constantly wants to keep us in and under all of us male and female he's setting us all free by his perfect act on the cross now that is romantic that's the, the perfect romance that there ever was one but I'm just going to read this passage from Galatians 4 1 and how the, the Lord is trying to set us free and the woman wanting more than she was allowed to have um, in the garden. She was looking for more. She was looking for more than just to look pretty and to serve food. She was looking for, to better herself, to expand her mind, to be able to be useful in, in society in all on all levels. And that reminds me of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that's the free woman that we are all trying to be and we're all trying to be children of the free woman when men lose their um, empire building mentality and um, 
allow women and also men to be able to, to be useful and free and to to be loving and good towards one another um, that's what we're all heading for and so the age of man is coming to a close it is coming to the age of man the domination of man is coming to a close man's self-will man's self-rule is coming to an end and it's going to be the rule of the bridegroom and the bride. So that is where we're heading. And that's a beautiful thing. It's this era of freedom. It's an era of, of agape love towards one another. Because without agape, we're nothing but clanging symbols. Galatians 4.1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under the tutors and governors until time appointed of the, of the father. Even so, we are children. We are in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time has come, and that's what the number 20 is, it means the fullness of time, a waiting period that's come to an end. God sent his forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, then, when you knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire to be in bondage again? So he's, there's a lot of people who want to be under the law again after you've been set free? That's ridiculous. Um... <clears throat> The height of romance, and this is this is why it's so romantic. Um, in the in the word about um, First Corinthians, when it's talking about the perfect love, which is agape, it's like it, when Paul says, "When you're a child, you think of a child." Here's the same thing: when you're a child, you're under bondage of someone else's leadership, but when you become an adult, you let go of that bondage. You're now becoming your own person. But also, it talks about. Um, um, being known here by God, that when we are set free and become children of, of the of freedom, you are known by God, and that's the height of romance, isn't it? Because in the in the First Corinthians it talks about the same thing. When you look in the mirror darkly, a dark mirror or a dark glass, you're looking in a mirror at yourself, but you're not fully known, and you want to be fully known, and you want to know God fully. You want to you want to be able to have that freedom to know each other. God can never be fully known. Of course, we know that. But he allows us that opportunity when we have been set free of our sins. We are given that access to God that we hadn't had before. God's not going to give us full access to himself or to his mentality, his thinking, his ideas, his creativity until we've been set free of our sin. Because we'd only take it, and this is what happens when we, we take something that God has given us, a gift, um, a wonderful thing, uh, uh, a, a new cure for some disease we take it and we explored it exploit it we hide it and this is what we're finding there are cures out there for cancer and all kinds of problems that are been hidden by man in order to profit instead of to benefit people they've been used to hide they've been hiding the, the things that god wants to give us free gifts of love and grace and romance because he loves us so much he's romancing mankind and he gives us gifts of free energy, all kinds of things. And what do men do? They take it, they hide it, they hoard it, they hoard it, they 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 exploit it, but they don't give it as a, a gift to other people. Certainly not a free gift. And then if they do give it out, they want a good pr price of penny on it, something that God gave them for free. You know what I'm saying? So that's why God is not going to give us just anything because while we're unworthy and still full of sin and spotted and wrinkled, why should he give us anything if we're only going to use it for ourselves or hoard it or uh, exploit it and, and cause other people to either have to, to, to go into multiple layers of debt just to be able to attain it? Why should he get, why should he do that for us? So that's what he, that's what he's waiting for us to be without spot or wrinkle in order to just give us the gifts that we want, we, we need so that we can expand and, and grow and become greater than, well, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for without spot or wrinkle so that he can bestow these gifts upon us. But until then, it's not possible because we will only, because of our sin, will use it for our own benefit.
You know what I'm saying? We will hoard it. We will make ourselves rich from it. We will we'll do anything to cause people to be suffering in order to make more money for ourselves or to kingdom build or whatever it is. That's the will of man. That's the miry clay in the, in the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? So Christ wants to set us free. God wants to set us free from this bondage. The law keeps us in bondage. And so he's actually saying to these people, you know, why are you, why do you want to go back to the law? When I, God is offering you freedom. Why do you want to go back to this, the base, the, the bottom rung when you could go to the top? Why stay in the bottom when you can go to the top where there's freedom? And the Ten Commandments, that was, that they were, they were going to go back to Egypt. Back to their slavery. Rather than have bondage. This is what this is why people are. They're they're more concerned with staying the status quo. They're more concerned about filling their own pockets or their comforts or creature comforts than having to face the the challenges of freedom, which means to grow up. Stop being children, stop being little little led around by the nose children. And to become adults means to let go of your childish ways, childish ways. But a lot of people don't want to be adults. They want to be children for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> how how turn you again to be to the weak and beggarly elements where until you desire to be in bond again to be in bondage? You observe days, months, and times of and years. I am afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, I, I may have maybe wasted my time with you guys. I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid for you that you want to go back into bondage and and this this vanity. Brethren, I beseech you, but as I am, for I for I am as you are. You are not uh, you have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not nor rejected, nor but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness I you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy, enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Ye that are, exclu um, they, ye, they would exclude you that you might affect them. So he's talking about the Pharisees and the, the people who've infiltrated the church the church that was free from the law and they're trying to bring, they're coming back and they're um, affecting them with this, these lies and deceptions, these Pharisees and these religious spirits. <clears throat> My little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be, pre and to be present, present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. <clears throat> Tell me, <clears throat> Ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the truth? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondsmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondswoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. These which are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered through bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is in bondage with her children. <clears throat> but Jerusalem, which above is free, which is the mother of us all, for it is written, Rejoice, thou bearest that bearest not, breaketh forth and cry, though which travailest not. For the desolate has more children than she that has a husband. Now we, brethren, are as Isaac, Isaac were, are children of promise. <clears throat> but as that he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what sh saith the scriptures? Cast out the bondswoman and her son, for the son of the bondswoman shall not be heir with the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of the free. We are children of the free woman, the Holy Spirit. And we have been born again, as Christ told us all to be. In John 3, you must be born again. And to understand this principle of freedom, you have to be born of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> because as long as... You are listening to those who have not been born again. They are still under the spirit of Agar. They're, spirit of, they're under the spirit of law. And they want to keep you in bondage. They want to keep you suppressed. They want you to keep you under your, their feet. 
under their control, under their bondage. And this is what's happening through the church. We are breaking free. Every move of God, we have been breaking free from each moment and each attempt to keep us and suppress us from finding our true freedom through Christ Jesus. And now we're in this next move of God and they're still trying. That religious spirit is still trying to repress us, still trying to keep us down, but it's not going to work. It has already failed. It's a done deal. <clears throat> it's a done deal, people, and it's happening. So I, I suggest you get on the right side. Let go of your religious spirit. Let go of your ideologies and your false doctrines. Okay, and move on because it's time to move in the spirit of freedom because that's where we're heading. We're going to freedom. We're in freedom right now. Only you don't know it. And God is too, he is forcing people to choose sides. He's forcing men and women to see what side they're going to be on. They're going to be sheep or they're going to be goats or they're going to be wheat or they're going to be tares. Okay, are you going to be wheat or are you going to be tares? And unfortunately, I see a lot of Christians choosing to be tares choosing to be goats because they haven't they don't they still are clinging to old doctrines they don't realize and understand what god is doing nothing in this world is a coincidence the things that are happening are not a coincidence this fight this battle that we're under with it with the american election it's already won <clears throat> only a lot of people don't realize it yet either they don't realize it or they're fighting against it and i suggest you get on the right side of God and the spirit of freedom and that the, the age of man and his dominion and his kingdom building is coming to an end and it's time to understand it. It's the time of the bridegroom. Okay? Look at this wonderful romantic passage in Song of Solomon. Let's just go to the Song of Solomon for a second and read this prophetic word that's in the Song of Solomon of agape love of the bridegroom and the bride and how they are going to rule and reign over the world. <clears throat> I don't know where I should start or what I should read. Let's just read chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 1. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince, prince's daughter! The joints of thy thigh are like jewels, the work of thy hands like of a cunning workman. Thy navel, navel is like a round goblet which wander, want, wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. The, thy neck is the tower of ivory, thy eyes like the fish pools of Heshbon, by the gates of Bashrabim, thy nose is a tower of Lebanon which looketh towards Damascus, thine head is unto thee like uh, like caramel, the heart the hair uh, thine head like purple, the king is held in the in the galleries. How fair and pleasant art thou, O love, for delights. Thy this is this thy stature is like a palm tree in thy breast to clusters of grapes. I said, I will go to the palm tree, I will take hold of the bough thereof. Also, uh, Now also thy breast shall be the cluster of vines, and the smell of the nose like apples. And the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved, that goes down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. Very erotic, isn't it? Very, very erotic words there. But it's the, sto it's the story of, of love, pure, perfect, romantic love, of Christ romancing the people, romancing us through his beauties that he surrounds us with, with taste, sight, sight sounds, um, um, music, music and taste and beautiful things that he has given us, the beauties of this earth in order to romance us. He is the ultimate romantic. Christ is romantic, people, and he has given us this beautiful earth, this beautiful world to appreciate the, the beautiful foods and tastes and sound, sights and sounds and, and the, the uh, lovely buildings that we can build for ourselves with the glory of God in them if we bring the glory of God, God into them because he loves us so much and that is romantic. So it's kind of an interesting, kind of funny thing that this movie that I normally would never have uh, recorded, I record and it turns to be this wonderful romance no, um, movie about a woman finding her mother in this journey in order to find her true love 
her her bridegroom through this diary that her mother leaves behind. In this this wonderful game, this not a game, but it's a search, a search for her heart, a search for her her true self. And she's set free by the discoveries she makes. And it, that's what this whole book is about. This is what the Bible is about. It's about our freedom, being set free from those who want to repress us, keep us under bondage, keep us from being healthy, keep keep us from being wealthy, keep us from our, our dis destinies and our purposes in life, repress us, um, use us as slaves and bonds children, children of the bondswoman, because they themselves are under bondage. They want you to be under bondage. But that, that love, that perfect agape love, which is to be known, to be fully known, to know and to be fully known, that is romance. That is romance. And that's what we're all heading for. It kind of reminds me of that movie. Um, in fact, it reminds me a lot of that movie. Um, there is a Barbara Streisand movie I absolutely love. And it's called The Mirror Has Two Faces. Now, isn't that interesting? It's about a mirror, about a woman who who's, um, sees herself as unattractive. She sees herself as a spinster, unattractive woman, um, but she falls in love with a very attractive, intelligent man. She's an intelligent woman, and she's she's looking for just the right man to to set her heart ablaze. But what she says in the movie is really interesting. She says, when her, her friend's asking her what she's looking for, basically in a romance, and she says, what I would really love is to, someone really knew me. I want, to me, that would be great if someone really knew me. What toothpaste I use, you know, what side of the bed I like to sleep on, that sort of thing. To be fully known. And and through this relationship that she has with this kind of absent-minded professor guy, he he's observant. He's he's a dunderhead, but he's observant, and he noticed little things about her, and that fills up her romantic heart, that romantic part of her that says, "I want someone to notice me, I want someone to see me, I want someone to fill that gap inside of me that says, I just want I know I know where you are at all times. I'm aware of what you're doing. I know I'm aware of what you're eating. I'm aware of what you're wearing." And I like it. I like you. I always love that movie. But it's like I said, it's an interesting name. The mirror has two faces. So anyway, just to say that that it's a funny coincidence that this movie that I was watching, when all of a sudden I felt like I was exploding <laughs> from the inside with light, that it would be this movie. And when I went back to watch it, I thought, this is not a coincidence. This is an amazing little movie. I, I'm really happy I watched this. This touched my heart. And I would really recommend it. If you if you have the opportunity, the ability to watch it, I don't know where you can find it. I uh, Maybe on the on the, Harle on the Harlequin, the Hallmark channels or whatever movies, they, they get these particular ones. But it's called A Gift, the... Uh, the gift of a miracle, or the gift of, oh, what's it called now? Uh, the gift of miracles. The gift of miracles, I think it's called. The gift of miracles. Um, yeah, really, really cute film, and not a and not a coincidence that I was watching that particular film at this time. So really, really interesting. God is so interesting. It's so good. But anyway, um, yeah, God is the ultimate romantic. People, there's romance in everything. Um, he's wooing us, he's leading us, he's guiding us, and he's setting us free by the Holy Spirit. Let's just read that passage, shall we, about the Holy Spirit being born again, and that would be found in John chapter 3. We always stop at, most people only know one verse in this whole chapter. Most people just read, know one verse, and that's John 3.16. But that's just the beginning of this passage. This passage is about really about water baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Peter said about being born again. You must be born again. You must be born of the water and the Spirit. When Jesus, when Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, is actually this whole passage. 
John 3, 1, and there was a, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This is a man who lived under bondage his whole entire life. He was one of these, these pharmaceutical religious type people. And he didn't understand this principle. Again, because being born of a woman, first of all, Pharisees didn't like women. The Pharisees don't like women. They're women haters. They thank God every day they're not born a Gentile and not born a woman. Okay? The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the Pharisees had adm admitting that no man could do these miracles except that God be with him. But he's afraid to say that in front of his, his cohorts, his fellow Pharisees. He's afraid to, to approach Jesus with this, this knowledge in front of everybody else because of his feet of clay. That's why. And God, and Jesus answers him, basically, just, he's making a statement here, and Jesus is answering his statement with the truth. He's doing it because he was born again. Christ was doing the miracles he did because he was born again. When was Jesus born again? At his baptism. Jesus was born again, people. And he was born again of the Holy Spirit when he got into the waters of baptism. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What, are the king, what is the kingdom of God? The miracles that he does. The miracles, the, the beautiful things that, that, were, that Jesus was doing, healing the sick and feeding the hungry and, and giving a sight to the blind. He wasn't hoarding it. He wasn't hoarding the gift, and nor was he using it to exploit and become rich. And build a kingdom for himself on earth. He wasn't doing that. He was giving it away free. Okay. Nicodemus said unto them, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. How are you born of the flesh? When you're in your mother's womb. How are you born of the spirit? When you're in the mother's womb. The Holy Spirit, that's water. The water represents the womb. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it lists, lists and hears the sound thereof. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell from whence it comes and whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? See, he doesn't understand it. And Jesus is, is shocked and he doesn't get it. Jesus said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knows not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do not, uh, that we, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and receive not our witness, and you, you receive not our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This is exactly what I'm saying. Why would God bother to give you a gift of knowledge or, or these miracle powers if you're not willing um, to let go of your earthly ideas, your earthly doctrines. God is not going to give you these, this, the, king, the gifts of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. He's not going to bestow them upon you if your mind's full of darkness and wait, just looking for some ways to, to get rich and some way to exploit the things of God. You see how that ends up? All these cures for cancer, people giving millions and millions of dollars every year for the cure to cancer, which I'm sure they've cured them a thousand times over by now, but because they're making so much money raking it in for this all this fake research that they're actually researching ways to kill you rather than to heal you, this is what darkness does. Why would God give you anything if you're not willing to be born again? Give me a break. So if I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man ascends up to heaven, but he that comes down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And Moses lifted up as Moses Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believeth in him should not perish. Excuse me, but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world, uh, sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world through that the world through him might be saved. That is romance. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. He came to send his son 
to save the world. That is romantic. He that believeth in, on him is not condemned, but he that believeth is condemned already, because he has not believed in the, the name of the only begotten Son, the only born Son. That's what begotten means. The only born Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, isn't that interesting? What's happening is the light is being shed on all these wicked, evil people. And they are trying as desperately as possible to cover up their sins for as long as they possibly can. But guess what, people? The light is going to be shot upon them. That's what that whole thing, when I was exploding, I was seeing light coming from my mouth, from my fingers, from my toes. Because light is going to be shone on these evil, wicked people, whether they like it or not. They had the opportunity to repent and repent of their wickedness. But they would not because they prefer the darkness. Too late. So sad. I'm sorry, but it's too late for you. There's no more hope for you. Now I'm just going to read the last part because it's about the bride and the bridegroom. John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples to the land of Judea, and they tarried with them and baptized. And they tarried, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So that's Tom telling you right there, the same passage that Jesus and his disciples went to the land of Judea because there was water and they were baptizing people even more than John was. Okay. And John was also ba baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized and John was not yet cast into prison. Then there rose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews were about purifying, about baptism. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that is beyond uh, with thee beyond the river, uh, beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes. And all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except that it be given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am I'm sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly, because the bridegroom's voice, this is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. Man must decrease. The bridegroom increases, man decreases. John, as great as he was, he was decreasing because the bridegroom had come. And the will of man must decrease. From that moment on, when Christ got his ministry, Man and the will of man began to decrease. <clears throat> he that cometh ab from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, and that he testified, and no man receives his testimony. He that receives his te testimony has sent, set to his seal that God is true. For whom, uh, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Uh, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall see, not see life, but the wrath of God abide on him. So there it is, people. The bridegroom and the bride. And he's coming to collect his bride. He's starting to set his bride free. And we are children of the free woman. When you come to Christ Jesus, you become part of his church and you, get, you must be born again in order to receive the kingdom because otherwise you're going to always be under someone else's control and manipulation. Okay? So anyway, I think I've said enough on this video. But just a shock, a gift of miracles. That was the name of the movie, The Gift of Miracles. And like I said, I had Rita Moreno, which was quite a, a surprise. She had a lovely, lovely role in this movie. Um, yeah, no coincidences in this world, especially not in my life, I can tell you. seems like everything I do is ordered by the Lord. Um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say on this video. So God, God bless and um, give your life to Jesus Christ for this your opportunity. And uh, despise not the light, people, because the light is your redemption. Okay? And I will talk to you later.